for those of you who were here ago, uh, here a year ago, Steve, um, Steve and I came to talk and introduce you to a concept that uh, we were beginning to roll out and think about uh, related to the work that we do for um, the Regional Clinical Performance Council. Okay. Oh, thanks. Yep, thanks. So at that time, uh, the conversation that we were having is we recognize that many of you and other community partners are doing some great work in the community around social determinants of health. And I, Mary reminded me that I throw this term around all the time, like everybody knows what I'm talking about, but that's not true for everybody. So I just wanted to put um, a little graphic from Kaiser Permanente up here, um, listing what Kaiser sees as the social determinants of health. But other organizations have included other things like building resilience and trauma, uh, childhood um, ACEs. So at any rate, I'm putting this up just as a point of reference for folks to think about. But what we're trying to do with the mapping project, we moved to the sort of next phase of the project. And uh, what we want to do is begin to understand what community teams and groups um, are spread across Franklin and Grand Isle County working on these topics. Now, the social determinants of health may not be the priority for your team or your group, but if you're having conversations that address any of these concerns, including building, building resilience and thinking about trauma, um, we'd like to know who, who you are, but who the groups are too. Because what our intention is, is as we better understand who's working on these concepts, um, we want to build some, what I'm calling, bi-directional communication between our community who's addressing these groups and our um, health care system that's considering health care reform. Did that make sense? It makes sense in my brain, but do people have questions about what I just said? No? Okay. So the act, yeah. Okay. yeah wait, just not to spoil the part, just make sure you feel <laughs> appreciated. Uh, what you're looking for is groups that are involved. In other words, me as a food shelf, I'm on Vermont 211, Robert Northwest Foods on Vermont 211, but what you're really interested in is the fact that we have a food shelf alliance where a whole bunch of us meet and we have a hunger council where a whole bunch of us meet and address those issues. That's absolutely. what you're that's what you're looking for. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for pointing that out and providing clarity. Um, we know that many organizations and people in their own jobs do this stuff as part of their primary work, but what we're looking to map is our community groups and teams at this point who are working on these issues. So collections of people working together to address these concepts. Other questions? So Robert, you gave a great example too, actually. Um, the Hunger Council and did you say the Food Shelf Alliance? Food I never, okay. Um, I also sit on, I sit on the community health team. Um, I sit on our local ACEs team. I also sit on um, uh, a variety of other teams that address these issues. So what we're looking for, again, are the teams that are talking about these things. So what I'd like to do, if it's okay, I'm gonna pass around a couple of, in, well, Everybody take an index card, please. I'd love for you to um, write down the names of the teams um, that are working on these ideas. And um, perhaps if you're interested, listing yourself as a contact for that team and a number or an email that we can reach out to you. So as we're building that map and those connections, we have contacts for the teams of people that are working on these ideas. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'll send some this way. It's my hope as we, um, you know, sort of firm this this project up, um, and we actually map our community to better understand it. Um, we've got a couple of tools that hopefully in the future, maybe in the fall, um, that I can come and share with you and show you our ideas, what we're thinking about actually doing for that bi-directional communication. We're um, currently at the phase where we want to pilot the tools that we're using with some of um, with some of the teams we're directly connected to, our team, uh, to, to get a sense of how they work and if they make sense or if we need to make some tweaks to them before we roll them out to our larger community to get feedback. So that's kind of where we're at at this point. Oh, I'm sorry. Absolutely. Here you go. You got one, Brian? We're good. Okay. You good? We're good. Super. <laughs> oh, 
Do you want me to sign it? No, I didn't. I'll put you on. <laughs> and then when you're done with those, I'll just collect them. And then I'll be out of your hair for the day. We don't have any slides. Um, with the HRSA grant, it, this is more just to get the, the name of it. I feel like I'm in your face. Um, to get the name of it out there and get people familiar with it, it's a rural planning grant. So last year we applied as a community for this grant. It's a one-year planning grant. The goal is to apply by September for a three-year grant, which would be approximately $1 million, $300,000. $333,000 per year. Um, and the goal is to target uh, communities that have rural, rural unserved areas, unserved people. So Mary has the actual printout. I'm going to let you do that piece of it to right. get All a little right. bit more to the point. So last September, we were awarded a planning grant, which is pretty kind of unusual for um, the fed, federal government to say, we're going to have this planning grant, and then will go on to do implementation. So the planning grant for us, the whole uh, goal of the HRSA grant was to um, do some planning around reducing the morbidity and mortality associated with op opioid overdoses in rural areas and targeting um, targeting and creating strategy, strat targeting underserved areas and, and population, but also creating st strategies that are u uh, beneficial to our community to make those changes happen. Um, one of the neat things about that is that it just didn't say, oh, we're going to work on treatment and getting people treatment. Um, they gave equal weight to uh, work looking at prevention, uh, treatment, and recovery. And within prevention, um, it is reducing the occurrence of opiate use disorders in general, but also then reducing mortality. And we in this community have worked hard on um, syringe exchanges, um, uh, using Narcan as a reversal drug, uh, doing using drop boxes for prescription meds, mail back envelopes, all of those things. I feel like we've almost like flooded our community. It's hard to mm -hmm. to do that. So um, so that piece in some ways has already been taken care of. Um, treatment, we have worked to increase the medicated assisted treatment in this community and access to treatment. There is lots of room for more treatment, particularly stuff that for folks that don't quite uh, want uh, MAT treatment but want other alternatives. So that's one of the things that w has been discussed and also looking at uh, expanding recovery access and um, helping people start and stay in recovery. Um, and expanding any kind of peer recovery services. Because what we do know is that the biggest successes happen when people make actual connections with other people, like human to human connections. And so how do we do that and build recovery capital so people don't cycle back into um, uh, relapse and potentially, particularly with opiates around recovery, um, not being able to maintain any time in recovery. So we've spent some time. We had a great one day. Uh, retreat. retreat. I'm like, I don't know what that thing was, but <laughs> retreat. And, and really uh, narrowed it down to focusing um, on recovery services because many of the other things that we wanted actually folded into that. And so right now we're coming up with our plan. Um, and in the meantime, the implementation grant also came out um, rather than letting us finish our planning grant and then apply for the implementation grant. This uh, next round is actually coming in two parts, and we've chosen to uh, double up our, on our work and get that implementation, our plan done, and our implementation, and apply for this first imp implementation grant, which is going to be a million dollars over three years, which is a significant chunk of change to a community like ours. Um, and with all the other grants that have been going around, being able to work with other folks who are, are out receiving grants uh, or attempting, I'm going to say are receiving grants because I'm thinking positive, um, so that we can leverage the work and not duplicate it and not f uh, and work together rather than in isolation, which is you know a big killer to many communities. And so picking up pieces and it's nice to hear saying, oh, well, we're doing this, which then we'll take care of that, so why don't we focus on something else so that we get a lot more opportunity with the money that we are getting. Um, 
We've been meeting every other week on Mondays, which has been great and intense. Um, and one of the wonderful things about this group is, is to be able to have the uh, frank conversations about what does work and what doesn't work and why. Um, Maybe need name the consortium members too. We have a diverse I, group, which makes it even that much more exciting purple. to be working so closely with right. So these people in the these are the people that we've been working with every other week. Uh, Turning Point, Franklin County, uh, Restorative Justice Center, Franklin Grand Isle, Northwest Counseling and Support Services, Franklin County Caring Communities, Franklin Grand Isle Community Action, St Albans City Police Department, Northwest Medical Center, and uh, the Vermont Department of Health uh, at the St. Albans District Office. So, yeah. Other things we want to add? I would just say that, you know, Mary kind of touched on it, and the key is, like, we're, we're realizing more and more that when we look at recovery, that does touch on all three to some extent because we want to be able to do prevention in young people, and at the same time, if their parents are struggling with addiction and recovery, they're probably not going to go back to their households after being educated in the schools on how to maintain a safe home. So it's really to try to touch the family on all aspects. Um, also, looking at get, getting the services out, like Mary said, the peer recovery oh. services. I know Turning Point's been looking into wanting to expand into Enosburg. So that's something that we're looking at, is how can we get them the, the funding and support so they can do that. Um, trying to get access to more peer recovery coaches so we can try to simulate what's being done in other ends of the states. For example, there are two other areas of the states that are doing um, inductions in the emergency department. They have recovery coaches in the emergency department as well as the police departments. That's something we've been talking about, Mary and I have been talking about for years that we'd like to see happen. This grant might give us an opportunity to access some funding to be able to back that up a little bit. One of the biggest difficulties we've had is being able to compensate or even stipend recovery coaches in our county. So the goal would be to get some funding, get some support and backing to enhance what the recovery coaches can do and how far they can reach. Um, this grant was really looking to target who are who are the areas and the people that are underserved and we're pretty familiar from the last grant that I was part of the three-year federal grant and the studies that came out of that and then now working with the pain clinic that you know we look at Richford, Montgomery, Enosburg, Alberg like it's it's difficult to gain accurate statistics on who's not being served when we can't reach those who are not being served because they don't have phone service, they don't have internet access, they, we, they aren't being reached. So I'm really hopeful and excited that this will give us an opportunity, as much as we had so many different ideas and it's really difficult to filter down and just choose a select one or two because that's what this grant the funders are looking for are people who are going to be very articulated, reach as many people as possible. So we've really had to narrow down some great strategic ideas for the people that seem to be left out a lot with all these grants. It, uh, examples, a lot of times there's grants for people with DCF or DOC involvement. What about the individuals that don't have that? And yet they're in need of the services as much. Um, so it was hard because right. we're trying to reach as many people as we can. It ha we have to be really uh, choosy of our words and our, uh, our attack on this to make sure that we can, you know, get approved and that it's something that's doable too. So I think that with focusing on the recovery movement more so that's gonna help touch what the funders are looking for as well as the people at the table and all the population that they serve. So I know for me, like the team that we see every other week at the table and then on the side committee meetings that we have, it's been so refreshing just to see this community. Again, like I said in my introduction, you know, we have this community partnership and yet the things that become of just getting familiar with each other here, you know, working with Crystal and Robert and so many others in this grant. And it's like the passion and the, the hearts that are going into this work is super refreshing. So I think this is the beginning of what will hopefully have a beautiful ending and create some systems or movements that'll be sustaining after the grant ends. Right. Is that the Icelandic model? Is like if you don't attack the problem with the same, uh, I think of ferocity, but with the same amount of I don't know, what was the word? The same amount of resources, um, you know, to, to problem. I mean, we have to put that kind of effort and time and resources into the problem um, to create that solution. And, you know, this is, I think, one of the first times where I've been able to look at seven different grants and have six of them fly and all six of them be connected in some way. And that is a piece is that we can do little bits and pieces of everything, and but unless we're doing this in a comprehensive manner um, and with the constancy of purpose, this isn't going to change. Um, so, 
Robert, I'm just going to ask you to want to add anything. Crystal? Uh, it's a significant amount of money. It's a million dollars for three years, $300,000. It's a lot of money. You can do a lot with that. Right. Um, and uh, I think the, uh, the challenge is, is that the, um, uh, we're, we're a victim of our own success in the sense that there are the, the, the grant really from the federal government uh, nationwide is, is uh, uh, looking at a lot of communities that have barely begun to deal with the opioid issue. So they're wanting to fund some basic elements um, that any community would need just to begin the process of, of having resources available. This community already has those in place. So the question becomes how then, what's the next step? How do we enhance those? How do we connect them? How do we bridge gaps? Right. Fill in small places that where um, uh, services haven't been able to be provided and so on. And yet at the same time, make the fits, think as though we're doing a bare basic structure kind of a thing. So, so you know, the art is to write the grant for what we want and make them think it's what they want too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. We have good people to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crystal? I just um, really would like to thank, and I'm just not here, but Nina Curtis. She's been yes. a fantastic yes. yeah. um, kind of uh, facilitator for this group and just keeps us really grounded and uh, reminding us, you know, what's most important, and that's keeping uh, families integrated in the communities. Yeah. Exactly. So that's it. More to come. So when you hear first, that this is, is what the, it is. Is your grant proposal due in September, or will the grant no, start? No, the grant's due in May. Oh, okay, and, the, yeah. and it will start if we win. If you're awarded the grant, it will start you in you September. The grant. When we are awarded. Awarded. When? Yeah. Oh, there you go. My so. time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just interesting that the planning grant and the implementation grant is quite yeah, the overlap. But that's both. okay because we're focused. What does HERSA stand for? <sighs> oh. Health Services Resource Administration. Is that what it is? Resource. Health Rural Services? No, I think it's resources. It's, it's a federal agency. Oh, wait, Health Resources Services Administration. Yeah, that yeah. supports, right. technically oh, okay. supports NIMH. I don't know who, I don't know who yeah. they, their target is. Federal government. Yeah. Thank you. But they tend to send grants that tend to uh, end up in places like rural populations. Um, so I know sometimes when you look at the federal grants, we're like, oh, cities of a million or more. You're like, can we apply as a state? No. You know, where's Stacy? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mary, no. no. Right? And I'll call and ask because I'm like, like, where's it? Oh, well, we'll have a grant for you for that, but you never see those things. So this is. Um, I think some monies that will we'll do that because much of the opiate addiction um, originated in rural areas. So, so thank you very much. Thank you guys. Any other questions? <laughs> questions? More questions? I guess I have one. Yep. And I don't know. I mean, you guys are working, doing amazing work, and I appreciate it a ton. I wonder if, um, when I look at some of these things that have happened over the last few years when I've been involved in the community, I've seen stuff start up and then finish, sometimes because there's been change in staff or change in direction of leadership and those kinds of things. Right. And I wonder with this grant if there's some room to build some long-term structure and maybe even put some money into the long-term part so that there's money to keep it going, even if structure changes and uh, leadership changes and you know, people Right. change, if it could be built so that it's got right. some longevity and continue to help. So when you write grants, particularly federal grants, they want to know up front how you plan to make that work after the grant goes. You're so right. And so you can put it, now in more days, you can put it into stuff that's going to last after it's gone. Also that you can put it um, into activities that you can demonstrate so that other things will, uh, other areas will pick um, pick up that cost, but also in changing norms, cultures, and ideas. And so in some ways, when you're writing this grant, you want to do all three. Um, and staff will change, and, and things like, and we're lucky because we live in a community that is, that's not a huge, a huge problem. I think one of our bigger problems is actually finding the people to do the work once you get the grant, which is the bigger challenge. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but 
it's multi multifaceted, so that some of it might go away, but some of it, some of it will stay. So, but and we're going to be we're going to be question. judged on the sustainability that we're putting in the proposal too. So, and as you know, any system or agency is only as good as its workers, right? And on the flip side, part of what we're going to be writing is a way to make sure that sometimes it's not always just more money. That like we definitely are going to need money to do some of this, but sometimes it's just connecting the right partners together together and getting the right like MOUs created or new systems created. So whoever's in that position, there's more. Of those like warm handoffs and better access to services so that's going to be our goal is to find a way to get agencies to work closer together and not necessarily have to hire on all kinds of new staff as much as maybe just tweak a little bit of what the staff are doing so where that overlap is they're kind of doing it together and then the warm handoff happens and people are being bridged so that's the hope because that's a valid point what you said that's probably one of the most important things is when you come and stir the pot for three years and then disappear that doesn't help the community. So how can we tie up loose ends to make sure that if somebody moves out of state or something happens, that the people are still getting the service that they need? So. I mean, we all work, I mean, I can't say we all, but when you work in human services, and a few things happen. One, we aren't always so so focused on what our job descriptions are and what our, you know, our, our focus is. But when you have grants like this and they do those work, that work, sometimes it's nice to be able to look back and go, what does the community need and how can we um, adjust the work that's being done to address the, the needs of the community? And so that means changing a little bit of the job description or changing the way that we do the work or meeting people in different places rather than um, you know, always in the office-based setting. If we know that you know, adolescents never show up in an office, well, how do we, how do we capture them someplace else? And, and get the work that needs to be done for what they need in a way that they can do that. I mean, they think of adolescents, but pretty much anybody. People who are elderly, who have trouble with transportation, they're always late to their appointment because the person who drives them. How do we address that differently? You know? People who are working who can't. Well, yeah. yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. Right. And so those kinds of things, yeah. Other questions? Great, thank you. Okay. <laughs>
and look, you know, become national models. And so, like, this is a great and fertile ground for those ideas. And I'm going to use your line. There are some things that are not sustainable without grant funding. And so, I mean, it's that sustainability plan. The line you can't put on there is, well, if you don't fund us, it doesn't get sustained. Um, but the reality is, is that you know, in rural areas, we have very limited resources, and so what we do have a lot of is capacity building in the form of of people wanting to invest and wanting to make change, and that is that is, as you know from last week, like that is one of the hardest things to create, and you can't make change without it. So those, what we have that we do that well is is resources and readiness. How do we find the people to be a part of this, and how do we? create a community or move our community to a place where they're ready to make that change. Um, it's money that's always hard in a small community. And, and many times the government says, oh, well, your community will pick it up, but it, it, this doesn't happen, I don't think, anywhere. But it's a nice pipe dream that you know, our capitalist society will all become socially responsible. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so, so on that note, uh, the stretch will just stretch our arms up.